<clears throat> so once again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here. Uh, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Avi Stamen, and I'm the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today for our fourth installment of our Publication Success Interview Series, uh, where every month I speak with innovative thought leaders in the, field, in the wide world of academia about their research. I'm particularly excited about the event today, as this is the first time we're going to be focusing on a book that we translated, edited, and helped prepare for publication. Um, we're also going to be experimenting today with a new uh, a new format, uh, a bit more of a round table, uh, and we hope that it encourages fruitful dialogue and discussion amongst our panelists. Uh, it's important for me to clarify that this is a double event. Uh, what I mean by that is that it will go on for two hours in total, okay? The first hour uh, will feature Professor Jonathan Dechter, uh, the Chair of Sephardic Studies at Brandeis University, and Cedric cohen uh, the Director of uh, the Bucerius Institute at Haifa University, and they're gonna be discussing uh, Cedric's new book, uh, about Abravanel, an intellectual biography. In the second hour, Cedric's going to stick around um, and will also be joined by Sylvia fuchs fried uh, who is the editorial director at Brandeis University Press. And we're going to take a look, a behind the scenes look at the translation, the process behind the translation of the book uh, and how it was prepared for publication. Uh, that conversation should start about an hour from now. Um, yeah, in about 50 minutes to an hour from now. You're welcome to join us for either part or for both. Uh, we urge you not to be shy and ask your questions on the Zoom chat. Uh, your questions and feedback are important to us and we'll try to answer as many as possible. However, in order to keep things moving and not keep people for too long, um, we're gonna be waiting with uh, most of the questions until the end of the second session. Um, if you have a more personal question or wanna discuss your specific research, uh, so first of all, if you have a question for uh, academic language experts, you're welcome to reach out to one of the staff members. They all have ALE written at the end of their names. Um, and whatever we can't answer during the session, whether it's the ALE team or the Brandeis team, uh, we would be welcome to, you're welcome to reach out to us over the next few days uh, via email, and we'll share our, um, our information in order to uh, speak with you about any, about your research. Uh, this interview is being recorded and we'll send it to everyone who, anyone who attends will receive a recording. Uh, you can share it with friends and colleagues. Uh, and if you can't make, if you have to leave in the middle, you'll be able to see uh, the full session. Before we kick off the event and I hand off the baton to, uh, to Cedric and Jonathan, I wanna share some of the exciting achievements of academic language experts over the past year. Uh, we're grateful and proud to have helped scholars translate and edit and prepare their research in over 50 languages. Our articles and books that we worked on were published with top academic publishers, including Yale University Press, Harvard University Press, and of course, Brandeis University Press. Academic Language Experts provides customized translation, editing, and academic support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest levels. We also help scholars looking for help publishing their, uh, polishing, excuse me, polishing their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher. It's our mission to help our authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. So uh, without further ado, I, wanna, I want to, uh, to get started. So what I would like to do here, uh, one moment, let me just uh, stop sharing my screen. Here we go. Okay. So what I'd like to do just quickly before we get into the main, before I introduce our, our uh the main event. Um, I would like to uh, quickly run a, um, a poll for everyone to get a feel for our audience. We kind of want to get an idea of who it is uh, that's joining us today um, at, at this session. So um, I'm going to read the questions, uh, not because you can't read, but because in the recording it will not show up. So, uh, so the first question is, how many peer-reviewed academic publications do you have? That's just to give us a general idea of who's joining us today, if we have more you know, uh, junior scholars or if it's more senior scholars. Um, and then uh, I'm, you, uh, the second question is about your previous familiarity with uh, Abravanel. Um, is this the first time that you have ever heard the name or are you uh, uh, an established scholar that may be able to contribute to the conversation? Um, so I'll give everyone another uh, minute to, uh, to finish off their answers and then we'll, uh, we'll end the polling.
All right, thank you so much for everyone who voted. Um, I will share the results up on the screen so everyone can see. Uh, so it seems like we have an interesting split here. Uh, the majority uh, do seem to be more junior scholars, although there's a, there's a significant number of, of uh, more senior scholars, and, and I'm not talking about age uh, in terms of uh, publication experience. So, so that's good to know that we have a range of, uh, of attendees today. Uh, and also in terms of famili familiarity with uh, Abravanel, it seems like uh, we have a significant portion that have never heard, almost 50% who have never heard of him before. So that's, that's uh, maybe we'll want to give some words of introduction. Uh, and then also a, you know, also significant, another, you know, 50% uh, who are, are somewhat familiar, but maybe, um, you know, uh, probably not as familiar uh, as Cedric and Jonathan. So I'm sure they'll have a lot to, uh, to share with us. Okay, so now without further ado, uh, I want to introduce you to Cedric and Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Dechter is the Edmund J. Safra Professor of Sephardic Studies at Brandeis University in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies, as well as a faculty associate of the Tauber Institute. His research focuses on Jewish literature, history, and thought in the Islamic world during the medieval period, and in Sephardic studies more generally. Professor Dechter's most recent course offerings include Jews in the World of Islam, Introduction to Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and Judeo-Arabic Literature. Cedric Cohen Scali teaches mo early modern and modern Jewish philosophy at the University of Haifa, Israel, and is director of the Busarius Institute for the Research of Contemporary German History and Society. That's enough for me. Jonathan, take it away. Wonderful. Um, thank you uh, so much for the introduction. Are we spotlighted as you intend? Yes. Yes? Okay, good. good. Um, so I just don't see Cedric. The screen. There, now I see Cedric. That's good. So um, first, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, first, I really want to congratulate uh, Cedric on the production of this wonderful book. Um, um, I also want to uh, thank and, and, and praise also uh, Avi Kallenbach, who was the translator of this book, and also Sylvia Fuchs-Fried, um, who um, really brought the book uh, into its beautiful form and produced it as, as, as we see it. Um, so over, the, over a number of years, there have been a number of fine publications that have come out about Abravanel. Um, one of the great synthetic histories was uh, Ben Sion Netanyahu's 1953 edition, um, which came out in, I think, five different, uh, was edited five different times, published five different times. Um, but in more recent years, um, we've seen books by people like uh, Eric Lawi, uh, Seymour Feldman, who have really focused on more specific elements of, uh, of Abravanel's work. Um, so your book is the first I've seen in some time that really aims to be a fully integrative history that moves back and forth, and I think very beautifully, um, between uh, macro history, the biographical elements of Abravanel's life, chapters dedicated to specific works of exegesis, his philosophical, theological thought. Um, and you describe him as a person of irresolvable, irresolvable complexity. And I like that phrase uh, very much, um, especially since you know, uh, many people in the audience aren't particularly familiar with Abravanel, you know, whose life took him uh, from Portugal. Um, and then he, had, he was forced to flee and relocate in the kingdom of Castile, uh, Castile Aragon at the time, um, and then ultimately witnessed the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, uh, settling uh, different places uh, in Italy and Naples and later in Venice. You know, he was a person who, who saw a tremendous amount uh, in his life. He wrote about a tremendous number of topics, um, sometimes with elements that strike us as inconsistent. There are sometimes inconsistencies in his thought um, there it's difficult in some ways to reconcile his writing about the ideal life and the life he actually lived all of his activities uh, in the courts of Spain even as he had certain reservations toward the role of the Jewish courtier um, between his republicanism and his messianism um, so I'm hoping you can perhaps elaborate a bit and walk us through more of what you uh, describe as this irresolvable complexity of this figure Thank you so much, uh, Professor Decker, for this um, question. And it's it's a it's really um, I want to begin with um, a little bit of 
the problem of Abravanel within modern scholarship. Abravanel uh, was not adopted by a late 19th and 20th century scholarship, basically Jewish studies scholarship. Uh, beat uh, the German Wissenschaftes Judentum, or later uh, Zionist uh, Jewish studies. This is very strange when we think that in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, Abravanel was a cultural hero uh, for a Christian Hebraist who wrote uh, dozens of uh, translation, treaties, and in the discussions uh, on, in, uh, of his work. So there is a very strange um, a very strange a shift from early modern to modern scholarship. And I uh, personally experienced that uh, when I began to work on the Bravanel, I was all the time laugh, the people were laughing about this, you know, what, what are you, why are you bothering with a Bravanel? He stole all his ideas from, uh, other scholars, he's not really serious, he's not a professional philosopher. There, there was always a problem. Um, and uh, he could not be adopted by a 20th century uh, scholarship. And uh, as I began to, to work on Abravanel and found him actually very uh, fascinating. Um, I, I, I understood more and more why he was not a good candidate for a 20, yes, the 20, 20th century uh, scholarship. Because he made no clear cut rupture like Spinoza uh, from uh, his Jewish uh, uh, environment. Neither was he um, an esoteric uh, philosopher within his uh, community. No, there was no way uh, to fit him in the grand uh, narrative that were available at the time. And this made him uh, more and more intriguing and puzzling for me uh, as far as I uh, develop my research. Um, and I understood that he was sharing his uh, unfortunate lot with a lot of uh, scholars from the 15th century in Portugal and Spain. A, I was, uh, I had the opportunity very early on in my research on Abravanel to travel extensively in, uh, in, uh, in Spain and Portugal. And I was introduced to the new, new, new scholarship about uh, 15th century uh, intellectuals, Christian intellectuals in uh, Spain and Portugal. And they were struggling always uh, with the same question as I was struggling. Oh, you know, the, 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 the Spanish intellectuals, they are not really humanists. They are not really medieval philosophers. They, fell, they fall in between uh, the categories. As soon as a new school of, uh, of studies with uh, Professor Lawrence, and um, other people uh, around from the school of Salamanca suddenly developed this notion of the natural humanism uh, of the 14th and 15th century. And suddenly 
uh, we uh, uh, began to understand that there was a whole uh, new trend. And Abravanel was in some way uh, part of this trend, but it, this helped me to uh, arrive to this notion of uh, um, irreconcilable um, a nature of Abravanel. First, of course, we have to be aware of his way of writing, which is uh, a way uh, of collecting materials uh, that he produced himself, that he sometimes copied or, or plagiate, as you want, um, from others and put them together uh, as a series of uh, of um, what is called Drush commentaries on the Bible. So like these so were... So maybe yeah. maybe jump in a bit. So it's always interesting to see what yep. draws particular scholars to subjects. I'm going to talk about Netanyahu for a minute and then hopefully circle back uh, to you. Um, yeah, so Netanyahu in 1953, um, you know, describe what really drew him to a Ravenel was probably the aspect of his thought that he found most disdainful, right, which was his messianism. Um, Netanyahu saw in, uh, in a Bravanel a great missed opportunity, right? He's, right? he's writing at the end of the 15th century, um, following uh, writings by, by Yitzhak Baer. He knows that a Bravanel, he, he, he accepts to some extent that a Bravanel is a humanist of sorts. Um, but, you know, primarily he describes him as an encyclopedist, right? Somebody who drew together existing material and didn't say anything new. And now, you know, we know that's been revised to some extent by people like uh, Eric Lawi and yourself who talk about uh, the creative aspects of, quote unquote, harvesting earlier material and putting it in a new frame. But, you know, but Abrav but Abravanel for Netanyahu was, uh, this is something you discuss very nicely in the book, um, you know, the moment in Jewish history where he thought Jews should have begun the transition to modernity, right, from humanism and then to join the intellectual trends of the Renaissance and the early modern period going forward. But instead, Abravanel ends his life um, writing uh, the, the trilogy on, on, on messianism. Um, and in fact, uh, Netanyahu goes on to blame him for the messianic movements of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and 19th, yeah. Going on, going forward, that caused you to fail to enter modernity, and of course, you know, I think that's probably what drew him. He was just so puzzled by Abravanel's move in the face of the expulsion, um, and rather than seeing, you know, uh, hope in political restoration, you know, migrating to uh, to Palestine, hoping for uh, Jewish uh, sovereignty brought about by 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 human means. Um, you know, I think that's why he dwelled on him so much. So I'm wondering, you know, when I think about what, what drew you to uh, Abravanel, um, it is, as you described, the gap between his perception in Jewish circles in the 16th and 17th centuries versus how he's perceived by modern scholars. I also note that you know, when you start your book, the very first piece of Abravanel's writing that you explicate in some detail is the wonderful Portuguese letter, right? Without which, so, uh, Many people are, here are new to Abravanel. Abravanel has ex ex extensive, extensive writings in Hebrew, Bible commentaries, independent theological works, a commentary on the Passover Haggadah, um, a commentary on Perkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, um, uh, th these messianic tracts that I mentioned before. And throughout them, you know, you see us, you see an author who is so heavily steeped in the rabbinic tradition who quotes the rabbis of the Talmud and medieval Jewish thinkers as his sources of authority throughout. We're very fortunate, and he, and he has a number of letters in Hebrew as well. And then we're very fortunate to have this Portuguese letter, a letter of consolation um, that uh, was discussed extensively um, by Eli Goodworth and, and you build, I think, on his arguments and, and nuance them in some interesting ways, um, that you can sit also situate a Bravanel in the classical tradition, that suddenly his sources of authority change to Cicero and 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 Livy and Pliny and 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 so on, 
And I, I, I was struck by the fact that you forefronted that work. So I'm wondering is what, so I'm asking you, what drew you to Abravanel in this sense? Is it Abravanel the humanist as opposed to uh, Netanyahu's Abravanel the, the messianist? Okay, so that's uh, another excellent question and difficult question. Um, so the <clears throat> my uh, we are very privileged in the case of Abravanel to not only have this uh, literary document in Portuguese, but a lot of other uh, document. Uh, in Portuguese. This allows us maybe uh, much more than with uh, other uh, author from the medieval, late medieval period, um, to engage in a fascinating question, at least for me, which is uh, the, the multilingualism uh, of uh, Jewish intellectuals and the role it plays in the way they could accommodate a different um, a realm of communication. Uh, Abravanel was most of the time a merchant uh, and um, a court Jew interacting uh, on a daily basis, and surely with a lot of letters, uh, with Christians. And uh, he was surely from the very early age trained to uh, be able to uh, make the job. This um, uh, communication was not only uh, functional as it is sometimes or too often presented in uh, Jewish studies, uh, but it was also a window uh, into a vast uh, cultural and political uh, realm in which he could assimilate a lot of uh, trends and he was expected to assimilate a lot of, of trends. And when he wrote uh, this letter of consolation to another uh, Portuguese noble, he, it was his way also to uh, present himself as someone who has uh, um, integrated the, the literary convention of what we call nowadays uh, the 15th century vernacular uh, humanism of the Iberian uh, Peninsula. So, this gives us a window into uh, his Christian uh, background. Then when we move to the Jewish sources, uh, we can understand the kind of selection he is doing uh, when he's interacting in another sphere of communication. Uh, the communication, of course, uh, within his uh, community uh, and we uh, see that there are, um, well, especially when we compare his le Hebrew letters with his uh, Portuguese letter, we see very strong uh, uh, selections of sources, uh, but also the same uh, uh, desire to present himself as someone who has integrated the highest uh, literary standards, both in the Christian uh, sphere of communication and in uh, the Jewish uh, sphere of communication. So uh, this, gi this gives us, I think, a wonderful entry into the way um, a Jewish, uh, uh, the, the early modernity and this irreconcilability that you uh, were speaking of, which is uh, yes, in a special real realm, you can do something. In another, you can bring part of it, but not all of it. And you are playing uh, a double game, um, which is um, maybe what bothered a lot uh, moderns in the sense 
that they wanted something more, much more clear cut. And in terms of politics, for example, uh, and messianism, an understanding of uh, what is uh, the Renaissance and the early modern period, of course, um, um, a Netanyahu was a, had a very uh, ideological understanding of what is the Renaissance a period of uh, in the light of Machiavelli, basically, as if it was the uh, the Alpha and Omega of the Renaissance, where you have quite a lot of messianism, a lot of uh, magic, a lot of a um, um, writing which uh, which have not much to do with uh, with rationalism and so forth and so on. So. Yes, uh, I think a Bravanel uh, irritates uh, the modern sensibility in the sense that it uh, reminds us of uh, a, a difficult and never completely made transition uh, from uh, the Middle Age to modernity. And that was actually what was fascinating the uh, Christian Hebraist. Uh, because with Abravanel, they had both this uh, 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 Jew that was playing uh, the, the new Christian game with a lot of uh, references, that, and they felt that he had everything. And on the other hand, he, uh, he brought to them the rabbinic tradition, the medieval tradition, and he was giving them a sense of continuity that uh, actually uh, was not any more wanted later. Okay. So um, if we can then maybe focus in on one area of Abravanel's activity, um, where he seemed to take certain steps toward what in retrospect we could see as modern conceptions, but then stopped short of where people after him would go, um, would be on uh, his exegesis, you know, and um, since many people have not read the book and, and don't know of Ravenel, um, one thing that the book does very beautifully is it moves back and forth between the biographical elements of uh, Ravenel's uh, experience and then uh, to the works that are written during those periods of time. So the book has a tripartite division, time in Portugal, movement to Castile, movement to Italy, um, and, the, and the works are organized chronologically. So you can see what Abravana was writing when, and to speculate about what drew him to certain topics. So while he, after he left Portugal, um, this is, this point is, you know this, it's, uh, it's more for the benefit of, of uh, the audience. Um, you know, in Portugal, he wrote, uh, he started his, his exegetical works on the former prophets, you know, Joshua, uh, Judges, uh, Samuel, uh, first and second Kings, um, Kings was written later, but he got through the earlier ones. Um, and uh, what probably drew him to those works was the focus on uh, politics, right? It was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity for uh, Bravanel to, after having had to flee for his life, probably from Portugal, um, because he was uh, implicated in the, in, in the revolt, uh, um, he, um, he took it as an opportunity to reflect upon the role of uh, kings, of uh, courtiers, the relationship to God, uh, and such structures. Um, in the course of his writing on these works, um, uh, especially in his commentary on Joshua, um, he makes some interventions that uh, make moves toward what we'd see, we'd see as modern biblical criticism. That is, he'll, he notes the anachronisms within the text. He notes that there are problems of harmonizing different sections of the Bible that recount similar events. Now, of course, much of this was pointed to already before him by Abraham Ibn Ezra, never very explicitly, but in his commentary, even dealing with sections of the Torah, Ibn Ezra seems to draw attention to these problems of anachronisms, right? The Canaanites were then in the land, in Deuteronomy, it suggests that there must have been a later redactor of the text. And Abravanel, when writing about Joshua, was very happy to speak about later levels of redaction, of intervention, um, questioning biblical authorship. 
yet seeing precisely the same textual characteristics within the Torah, he doesn't draw the same conclusions, right? He, he holds fast to a more traditional, um, a more traditional uh, reading of, of, of why these anachronisms seem to take place. So I'm wondering, you know, is there really a way to think about why he's so innovative when dealing with the former prophets, but more conservative when dealing uh, with the Torah? Um, you know, it's striking, of course, that, you know, that Spinoza's uh, source um, uh, for his thinking about the authorship of the Bible is Ibn Ezra, his great hero is Ibn Ezra. You know, he probably had, and Ibn Ezra was simply hinting at the possibilities of these redactions. However, um, you know, uh, Spinoza, it seems that he had some works by Ravanel in his library, um, but he doesn't, he doesn't relate to him in the same way. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. Oh, it's a great question. Actually, uh, I wrote a long piece on this uh, question for the new book that I'm uh, that I'm uh, uh, preparing. That spanned this question from uh, Ibn Ezra to uh, to the time of Spinoza and trying to make sense uh, out of it. So. Um, why so a little uh, uh, if you allow me a little bit uh, professor uh, decker to tease you a little bit you 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 want uh, a Brahmanel to be completely modern you know that he goes uh, uh, even in the torah uh, whereas you know that's a little bit that's a little bit the sensitivity that why is he not uh, consistent uh, whereas the uh, the early modern were quite uh, okay uh, with the fact that he did uh, that in several spots and uh, and they didn't want a, uh, an overall um, uh, discourse. I will I will try to give you an example of that. So first, he uh, don't forget that a Bravanel is a merchant. He's a political figure, he's not a scholar. He's writing that uh, all the time in his life. And uh, we have also records of uh, real rabbis and philosophers who pay no attention to him because uh, that is, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's an oligarch. Uh, he's a man full of money. Uh, buying everything and uh, making himself into uh, into a great uh, scholar, so there was he was quite aware of this tension. Um, he uh, proposed in several uh, in, on several occasions um, an historical or rhetorical or literary understanding of the Bible. You find it in its most explicit way in the, in the introduction to the former prophets, but you find it also very interestingly in the introduction to Jeremiah, which is all, which blow the mind uh, of uh, Ibn Adoniao, uh, the, um, the, the, um, the editor of uh, Mikhaot Gdolot of the uh, Biblica Rabbinica uh, published in Venice and was completely uh, um, infuriated uh, against uh, Abravanel by the fact that he could say that um, Jeremiah it was not trained in literary writings and rhetoric. Therefore, he wrote with uh, full of arrows his uh, his book, and uh, well, well, and Ibn Adoniao say, "Oh, maybe Abravanel thinks he writes uh, better than uh, than uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet." So. If we look at, at the response of scholars by the time, this was actually seen as very, very bold. Uh, for the question of the Torah, I think, uh, of course, he didn't want to, uh, to 
uh, go and say that the Torah a, uh, was had several redactors and, and several layers. But if you look at uh, uh, Shirat Ayam, the discussion on uh, the song uh, of the sea, um, and then you you see that he's taking the same literary approach uh, and making then a long tradition until uh, your authors actually of uh, the the poetry of Alan Dalus and so and so forth and so on you know he's really making a history of Hebrew poetry and it is a very interesting so this is just an example uh, where you understand that uh, Oh well, uh, Brahman was a, politi a political figure. He he had a sense uh, what should be done and what should not be done, and also he was very keen and very. It was very important for him to present himself as a conservative figure. He was preserving uh, Torah, of course, after the expulsion, but even before the expulsion. He was self-fashioning himself uh, as a, a scholar that is preserving the Jewish tradition from dangers. Uh, so this is a posture that was developed, of course, by Kreskas and many other uh, writers uh, by the end of the 14th century. But Abravanel really developed that and uh, there is a very interesting mixing of this uh, conservatism with a lot of innovations um, uh, in the uh, pro properly in the text. And I think that here, this is a very fine example of uh, two, two trends that doesn't go together if we accept uh, a modern point of view, but if we accept uh, what I what I propose that by the beginning of the book that we are dealing with a multilingual uh, personality that has to play different roles in different realms, I think it makes perfectly sense. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. So I think you know Leo Strauss famously uh, portrayed him as a as a conservative. Um, even when it came to the topic of uh, Bravanel's republicanism, um, I'm hoping we can expand on that a little bit more now. You know, e even even there, um, Strauss thought of him more as uh, an advocate of theocracy, um, as a conservative thinker who was influenced by various Christian thinkers, um, but didn't truly embrace the humanism um, of, of of the Renaissance. Now. Um, People uh, who work in, um, in medieval and early modern thought know that the, the, the work by Aristotle that Maimonides didn't have access to was Maimonides was Aristotle's politics, right? And instead the centerpiece of the Jewish uh, political tradition, let's say in the middle ages, um, would have been Plato's Republic, right? And the question was about the correspondence between the Torah and its ideal system of governance um, over against the Republic. Now, you draw in, you know, in a later century, Aristotle's um, politics as the linchpin that allows for um, for Abravanel's innovations, right? And I think you make a very a couple of very nice points. One of them is that the same thinker can be conservative with respect to philosophy, generally speaking, but can be an innovator with respect to a specific area of thought, political thought, and republicanism in the case of, of Abravanel. Um, the second, that um, what, what he builds on is Aristotle's distinction between um, a constitutional mar monarchy and an absolute monarchy. So I'm wondering if you can expand a bit on the topic of uh, Abravanel's republicanism. You know, I mean, Strauss, again, you know, he'll, he goes so far as to say all it really means is that he's anti-monarchic when he reads about uh, Israel's asking for a king. Um, that uh, and that they, they they never should have asked for a king and that they should have uh, remained under the rule of the judges. 
Um, all he says is that Al Strauss says that Abravanel is against monarchy, but that doesn't tell you about whether he is for democracy, whether he's for aristocracy, whether he's for oligarchy. So I'm hoping maybe you can refine a bit uh, Abravanel's republicanism um, and, uh, and specifically what the place is of Aristotle's um, politics in, in his thinking. Well, so this is, of course, uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, writings. So two versions of the text, his commentary on Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 8 and uh, the Deuteronomy 17. Two times he wrote slightly different version of this text. Um, my, my answer, again, when we are looking today at uh, education in Israel, uh, the text of Abravanel uh, in the only democracy of the Middle East uh, doesn't uh, feature, uh, is not taught nowhere almost uh, in, uh, in Israel. And uh, uh, this is a very interesting, and in some, in, from my point of view, a very sad situation in which actually one of um, the earliest clear statements uh, in favor of uh, Italian republicanism and some connection with uh, uh, the regime of the judges is made. And there is very little echo uh, in the Israeli public sphere of that. This is uh, uh, this was abs absolutely not the case for the Christian Hebraists who used this text during the, the the revolution in England, and they were they were very fascinated by the the, the argument of Abravanel. So this text was was actually very much read, but uh, in, the, in the modern uh, uh, Jewish tradition, forgotten. This has to do uh, with uh, the position uh, of Maimonides as uh, the hegemony of Maimonides, not only as a legal scholar, but as a philosopher, as it was built uh, by uh, the Wissenschaftler Studentum and later Zionist uh, scholarship. And basically uh, what was done uh, is to uh, consider that um, uh, Maimonides a, was the culmination of a political understanding uh, of Judaism from which you could only uh, degenerate into something worse. Um, this interpretation uh, of Maimonides, which is not only the one of Strauss, but of many other scholars, is very problematic uh, from an, uh, a historical point of view. Now, what, 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 is a, what is bringing uh, Abravanel uh, new in as a political understanding of Judaism? First, the text of Abravanel is written after a major political crisis in Portugal. Basically, to make a, a long story short, an absolutist turn of the Portuguese uh, monarchy, in which the, the, the king, instead of being a primus inter pares, becomes um, an absolute king. And the nobility, which were the patrons of Abravanel, uh, is strongly reacting against this uh, absolutist move, and Abravanel is part of this reaction. And what is he bringing is very interesting. He is um, 
he is uh, uh, basically rejecting the uh, Aristotelian uh, distinction between tyranny and um, uh, constitutional monarchy, saying, and this was uh, this was actually what was happening on the ground uh, in Portugal, but also in Castile Aragon, there were there were some move toward. Uh, 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 so a kind of absolutism, of course, we should not exaggerate that, but th this was felt this way. And he proposed what was before monarchy, be it republicanism, uh, the, the, the Roman republicanism, or the, judge, uh, or, or the theocracy of the judges, as an alternative to, um, uh, to the destruction of the medieval, uh, of the medieval kingship, of the medieval uh, monarchy. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, political moment. And the, um, what was not understood for a very long time is uh, that republicanism is not so much linked to the future from the perspective of, uh, of Abravanel, but more to the past. So it was a way of conserving maybe this more medieval understanding of, of monarchy, whereas there is not so strong a, a difference between the king and the aristocracy. But on the more political and Jewish level, this was this understanding uh, that basically uh, there was no need for a perpetual uh, king and much more in the line a little bit uh, of uh, Bear and uh, Buber in the 30s. Uh, you had a religious community uh, fulfilling the Torah and which at times in, uh, for wars basically could, uh, could, could elect, could divinely elect a, a, a leader. So he was basically uh, taking the Christian notions of, uh, of, uh, of the Ecclesia, uh, but also this notion that there is a strong community under the law and basically inventing uh, a new understanding of um, the rule of law and the equality of the divinely in inspired uh, community, which sometimes needs a leader, uh, but not... <laughs> kind of a necessary uh, evil at times. Um, you know, and I, I like your reading very much that uh, his comment on Deuteronomy 17, uh, which lays out the laws of the king isn't doesn't necessarily imply that one should have a king. It simply implies if you're going to have a king, these are the moral conditions under which that that king can operate. Um, there's so many more questions I'd like to ask you. I really want to ask you more about um, Christianity um, in general. I think your reading of Abravanel is that as a, he's a less polemical figure than uh, other scholars have portrayed him to be, even when writing about Messianism. Um, but I know that we're, we're really uh, short on time. And so I would like to ask a question that will help make a transition to the second part of our program um, to start bringing us to uh, the, the matter of the translation, um, which is of course, you know, you're a translator. I've, you know, I've seen uh, that you've translated works from German into French, you've translated Freud from German into French, you've translated other things involving other languages. And so you're, you're obviously very um, attuned to the matters and challenges of translation. I'm sure as in the role of the translator, you've felt yourself, you know, wondering, am I betraying my source? Am I, um, am I accurately capturing, you know, what would the author say if, if Freud were sitting here next to me, what would he say about some of the choices I've made. And I know my, myself as someone who does some translating as well, it can be quite agonizing. It can be quite, quite agonizing. And you know, to quote the medievals, a uh, translator should have 
um, three things under their control. One is the uh, source language, the second is the target language, and the third is the subject matter. Um, and so uh, I haven't spoken to the people involved in translation about what that process was like, but especially for you as someone with the sensitivity of a translator, um, what was it like becoming the subject of the translation? Uh, did, did you recognize yourself in the English version? Did you, um, you know, without getting into the nitty gritty of like, you, you change this word or this word there, was, was, there, was there a feeling of alienation or estrangement for you uh, suddenly taking the role as the person being translated rather than uh, taking the role of the translator? No, that's a beautiful question again. Um, yes, a, so the process of, of, of translation um, is first, of course, changing uh, uh, public, changing audience. My goal uh, with the Hebrew Abravanel was not only uh, to give a, a, a new intellectual biography of Abravanel, but was also to um, challenge uh, both the uh, Jewish studies as they are uh, uh, as they developed in Israel, uh, we'll sp we spoke a little bit about that, uh, but also to introduce humanism, Renaissance into uh, the uh, Hebrew and Israeli public sphere, where, where they almost not uh, appear. This was also the occasion to uh, bring uh, the case of this uh, political thinker who in some way was not accepted. Uh, when we, we moved to uh, 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 an English-speaking audience, um, the, the question was completely different. Uh, Renaissance, humanism are not subject that needs to be sustained, culturally sustained. Yeah, there is plenty of ex extraordinary uh, studies about this field. What uh, needed to be sustained uh, was uh, the question uh, of um, Jews and Jewish intellectual in this transitional and very complicated uh, period. So um, my, my, my intention there was more to um, try to make it clearer for early modern scholars and lovers uh, to uh, what what could be the life and the thinking of a Jewish intellectual in this period uh, to make it appealing and to try to a little bit a uh, build a bridge with the life of a Bravenel between uh, Jewish Renaissance studies and uh, Christian Renaissance studies, basically, um, in we're trying to, to merge a little bit more these two fields and trying to show how much uh, we can gain uh, by uh, collaborating. And I think the English language and the translation of, uh, of the book and making uh, the, the, the Hebrew text into English is trying to, to build, actually I did not only translate from Hebrew, we, tra we translated a lot also from Portuguese, uh, from of course Latin and uh, Spanish and other uh, uh, Italian and other languages, trying to uh, f uh, make of uh, the English a meeting place of all uh, these uh, literary uh, traditions and also to dream 
of uh, of a Renaissance scholarship that is trying to merge these sources, uh, and uh, that 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 was the that was the idea. And I think with Abravanel, this is particularly uh, possible. And um, yeah, I wanted also uh, to just to say uh, one more thing to connect my, my Abravanel with your work, uh, Professor uh, Dechter. Um, you wrote about praising. Uh, and I think that uh, Abravanel, <laughs> a lot self-praising, uh, and uh, as I was uh, preparing uh, our meeting, I found a lot of uh, connections uh, uh, with uh, what you uh, developed in, in your book. Uh, and we could say that Abravanel uh, invented the self-promotion, uh, self-praising, uh, and uh, this was a way also to to thank you and also to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, your beautiful uh, book. Well, thank you so thank you so much. But uh, this is this is your moment, and I'm very happy to be here to uh, to celebrate your your great accomplishment. Um, so. Um, this is when I believe I am to fade into the background and I'm turning the floor over to Avi, but it's been a great pleasure uh, speaking with you. It's felt a lot like just having a coffee with a colleague and um, I thank everyone for, for sitting in on our, our coffee. Thank you so much, Professor Dector. Great, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. thank you to both of you very, very much. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, I'm, I know I can speak for myself when I say that I learned a lot, you know, about a Bravanel that I did not know prior, and it sounds like it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing more. Um, I also think that it it was a good segue in terms of speaking about translation. Uh, we're going to speak in the second half of the um, in the second half of the event now about. Uh, you know, the sort of behind the scenes uh, of how the process worked um, together with um, Cedric is, is staying along with us. And I'm also going to, uh, to highlight uh, Sylvia, who's going to join us in a minute. Um, uh, and no, my apologies. Um, now, what I would like to, but before we do that, um, I just want to quickly uh, do two things. So first of all is I'm going to share my screen again. And I am going to, um, so first of all, I encourage everyone who does want to learn more about the book to uh, check out the book. Uh, I put a link into the uh, chat so you can uh, learn more about the book and, and make a purchase if, if you're interested. Um, and so that's number one. Uh, number two is I also want to uh, encourage everyone to uh, check out, one second, my apologies. Yes, check out our upcoming uh, events. Uh, we have a uh, we have an every this is a monthly um, monthly series that we do with uh, leading leading uh, academic publishers and thought leaders in the world of academic publishing. Our goal is really to help authors better understand the publishing process and be able to navigate it. So uh, coming up next month. Uh, at the end of May, uh, we're going to be speaking with uh, Stephanie Palvast from uh, Brill. She's actually the head of open research at Brill. So if you haven't had any questions about how open access works, um, what that process looks like, and whether it's right for you, um, I definitely encourage you to come and attend because she has a wealth of knowledge about that. Um, and then uh, in June, uh, we're going to be interviewing Marshall Poe, who's the editor in chief of the New Books Network. I know uh, Cedric, you were just on, you were just interviewed as part of the New Be New Books Network uh, Jewish Studies, right? There you go. So, so they have some great podcasts, uh, uh, split by field. Um, you know, really any field that you're involved in, there's probably a podcast that's right for you. But he's going to be uh, talking about how scholars can uh, maximize, can use new media to maximize the impact of their research. So, um, uh, we're going to put a link uh, to that. Uh, in the chat, Aviva, if you could put a link to the upcoming events in the chat. And, you know, just like every event that we do, uh, it is uh, free of charge and you're welcome to join us. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's transition now to the second half uh, of our discussion. Um, I do hope that, that you stick around with us because I think there'll be some really interesting uh, insights. So like I said, we're joined again by Cedric, also uh, by Sylvia. Uh, who's the uh, executive director of Brandeis University Press. So all the questions that you ever had about 
uh, how, how to go about publishing your book, uh, this is the time. Um, and also, um, I hope that Avi Kalmbach, the translator of, uh, of Cedric's book, is also with us. So we might, get a, we might sneak a question or two in for him to kind of get his perspective on, on how things, uh, what, what things were like. So uh, let's, let's kick it off. Um, Cedric, can you just talk, and, and this is going to be more quick hitting, so let's, we'll try and keep our answers to a minute or two so people get as much information as possible. Can you talk about how you went about the process of finding a translator for your book? Um, and how, like, what criteria did you use when you were evaluating maybe, you know, sample, different samples that you saw from different translators? How did you evaluate what you thought was the right fit, uh, considering the complexities that Jonathan uh, spoke about prior? Yeah. Uh, so, um, my, I had the opportunity to receive uh, several samples uh, from translators, <laughs> and uh, until I... Uh, came to to you and uh, and and Avi uh, Kalimbach um, what I felt was a oh, especially when you, when there is a book with a lot of sources the translation of of the academic prose was okay but as soon as it began uh, with uh, uh, with sources you felt that the translator uh, was not at ease uh, with, the, with the sources, uh, could not really uh, uh, make, uh, make the jump in his head from translating a prose from uh, the early 21st century and something that is from uh, the 15th century. And that, that was for me, uh, and with, uh, when, uh, when uh, I uh, discover, and I'm really uh, very, very happy, and this is the occasion to thank uh, Avi Kallenbach, discover Avi, this was really, he could, he could do both, and very, uh, very good, and uh, that, was, that was for me the, the most important thing. Great, thank you. And Sylvia, tell me just from your perspective, um, when you're, let's say, commissioning a book, um, or considering a proposal of, from a scholar who maybe is not a native English speaking uh, scholar and is writing or is translating, you know, uh, um, primary sources like Cedric alluded to uh, from other languages. What are your biggest concerns um, as a publisher? Um, thank you. I'll, I'll continue on from where Cedric left off. Um, there are many different registers that we're all looking for. Um, so in, in Cedric's case, we were talking about the sources. So you need a translator who understands rabbinic sources, the Talmudic sources, the biblical sources, and, and can tackle medieval philosophy. Um, when you're um, translating a book about uh, women, um, women readers uh, in the Haskalah period, you not only need the register of the scholar in the 20th century and 21st century writing about the phenomenon, but you need to have a translator whose ear is attuned to Hebrew Haskalah language or Yiddish Haskalah language. So we're always looking for the ability of the translator to stretch in many different directions and to be sensitive to different registers and different time periods of Hebrew or Yiddish or whatever other language we're talking about, um, as well as um, translating Israeli scholarship, modern Israeli scholarship or Hebrew scholarship um, into accessible English. Uh, it's supposed to sound English. It's not supposed to sound Hinglish. Yes, we call it, in the office we call it heaplish. Yes, but it's, it's yes. some form of combination which uh, right. which doesn't it just doesn't read off the tongue. I, I find that with especially um, you know texts that are translated the other direction within a few minutes of reading, you know, a, an attentive ear can pick up when it's a translation. And actually, right. the way I define it for for you know for my team is if people can't pick up on the fact that it's translated and they're enjoying their their experience reading the book, then that's when you know you've accomplished your goal. Um, because it, it's been, you know, on the one hand, it's this golden balance between being true and authentic to the original, you know, uh, author. You can't, right? The translator can't take too much leeway in making up their own ideas. On the other hand, if it's not written in an accessible and coherent and clear manner, 
then you haven't accomplished the, the, the translation, which is, which, which, is, which is a challenge. And I know that you know, for, for, for many scholars, just getting used to hearing their own words in, said by someone else can be a little bit jarring um, and, and, and take some time to get used to. Um, well, in my experience uh, over the many years in a Tal at the Tauber Institute for the study of European Jewry, um, we have published many uh, works of scholarship in translation. Um, what we've learned uh, along the way is that uh, a translator can not only uh, transmit the text into English, but very often the translator is pushing the author to clarify what he or she meant originally. Um, sometimes in the original language, when the author feels you know, at ease, um, he or she is not trying to be exacting or not trying to hone in on an idea in, in as many or as few words as, as necessary. But when a translator tackles that text, the translator is not only translating, the translator is interpreting the intent of the original and very often can push an author to um, acknowledge or to reach deep down into their gut and really express, or the translator helps him or her really express what the original intent was. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very true, and I think that's a very nice way of of, of putting it. Um, so, so I think you both alluded to this concept of translation, not just as transmission, but also as cultural adaptation. Also, right, Cedric, you said that you had a different goal with the English book than you did with the Hebrew book. So, at what point, just from a very practical standpoint, at what point did you actually make those adaptations that you decided that you were going to do? Did you do? Did you edit your book beforehand in the Hebrew and then send it out for translation? Did you do it sort of during the process, or did you get the translation of the raw material and then you adapted it uh, for your needs? Yeah. So uh, this was uh, Avi Kellenbach and I. We we spoke about it uh, from from the very very from the very beginning that uh, the idea was not, as uh, Sylvia very rightly said, to translate in the in the, in the, in the sample way, but really to uh, transform the book uh, when needed. Uh, in order to uh, to reach the audience, so we this was a very conscious move that uh, we discussed toge together. Um, so what it meant practically, it was sometimes yes, I I I added uh, pieces uh, uh, into the manuscript quite a lot actually. Uh, um, and we had uh, meetings or conversation over the phone uh, where uh, the question of, of course, translating the sources, but also uh, to push uh, each chapter toward its uh, a real culmination, a real clear end, and so forth, so far and so forth, and so forth. And uh, that was something that I'm really grateful uh, both to Sylvia and uh, to Avi that really uh, I tried to, yeah, really to push the book forward. Sometimes you have to accept that uh, from your perspective, you're uh, leaving your easy, uh, ambiguous, uh, formulation and you have to choose one uh, which is the less ambiguous a little bit uh, more risky. Uh, maybe uh, you can uh, then be attacked from their specialists or scholars. But uh, a book, a book is not only meant for a kind of a very elitist uh, discussion uh, among the specialists. Uh, this is more articles. Uh, a book is really a, a place of encounter between specialists, a broader audience, and uh, we want to, 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 to bring as much people into the conversation, into uh, the love of the, of the matter and the subject. So 
sometimes you have really to make some choices. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, I remember quite a lot of time that uh, I had to to really uh, leave this uh, easy position when you you know you don't really decide and so and uh, that's that was uh, that was really the process of translation and um, yeah. So, so this is a good time, I think, in, to bring in uh, Avi Kalabach, who was, uh, it was an, an early academic language experts has been with us for, for many, many years. Um, I also want to credit, um, uh, he's not here, but Dr. Adrian Saxon, who, uh, who edited uh, Avi's translation. Um, they both were a great team together with Cedric in, in, in making sure that it came to its full culmination. So Avi, I just want to put you on the spot here and just quickly ask you a little bit about the process of, of translating Cedric's book and like what what were maybe, you know, some of the most challenging parts of the translation and, and what strategies did you come up with or whether you had prior or came up with, you know, during the work uh, in order to ensure that it was, uh, you know, fulfilled its goals? Um, thanks, Avi. Um, uh, well, I think, uh, I think, uh, both uh, Cedric and Sylvia had mentioned the, the issue of primary sources, and I always bring that up as one of the more difficult parts of translation. Um, I, I know from experience, I've seen uh, people get translators who were excellent at translating modern prose, and then as soon as they encountered the primary sources, uh, things went awry rather quickly. Um, so if, if I have to be honest, it was the, uh, Cedric, your prose is excellent, so I didn't have so much trouble with that, but the primary sources certainly required not only, um, it, on the one hand, it required research on my part, because to be frank, I do not speak fluent uh, or early modern Hebrew. So uh, I do have some training in medieval and early modern Hebrew, but I, I had to do research and I couldn't treat it like uh, a language that I spoke fluently. So that took work, but obviously I had to turn to Cedric who is the expert on the material. And, um, and I think uh, as Sylvia put it, it it's, the dialogue between uh, the translator and the author is so important. And the, the difference between, I've, I've translated now a, a few books, um, and the difference between authors who sit down and talk to me and are willing to have that dialogue with me and authors who just accept what I send them and they're like, that's great. It, it's, you can't compare those two translations. And uh, working with Cedric, um, we, we really did. We, we, I pushed Cedric and Cedric pushed me back and we, we really had a lot of back and forth. And that was specifically important for the primary sources, which I said is the most difficult thing because at the end of the day, I needed to talk to the expert on those sources. And then we had to together basically create the translation. So I didn't even feel, a lot of the time, I didn't feel like I was the translator. It was our uh, dual effort of working together to how, how do we translate what, uh, the scholar from hundreds of years ago what was saying, how do we translate that into English? And together we pooled our talents together. So that was definitely the most challenging thing, but uh, in my case, at least, uh, I had a good, uh, I had a good uh, rapport with Cedric. So we were able to, I think, uh, get over that more difficult uh, aspect of the translation. Yeah, and, I, and it, it may sound it may sound simple and straightforward, but I think Avi, you once told me that you know you you've you will read over a text. What is it, five, six, seven, eight times before you feel like you know it's it's ready to be even sent on for editing. Meaning, um, you know the 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 idea of just sitting and, and and writing a translation and then sending it off, I think is is mistaken. Every time you read, you pick up on something that you didn't pick on prior, pick up on prior, especially when you've given it some time to sit and. And think through, and then when you the, the experience of writing a translation as a translation, as opposed to reading your translated work afterwards, a few days detached um, as an independent text, I think you know sometimes makes us rethink entire passages that maybe we thought had been translated you know uh, properly before, and now we realize you know what 
yeah, as in, as an independent entity just doesn't cut it. Yeah, that's true. I'll, I'll take your silence as 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 confirmation of it. <laughs> I, I I agree. I, w I would also add just one more thing as uh, you mentioned Adrian, who works uh, with ALE. Uh, it, it helped me a lot to have the, uh, the, the eye of somebody who wasn't involved directly in the translation and who was a native English speaker look over it. Because Adrian didn't know what the, who's the, the chief editor, I think. I don't know what we call him now, but um, he, uh, he doesn't, he didn't necessarily read the Hebrew text. So when he would read my translation, he would sense all those Hebraisms quietly sneaking in. And that was uh, very helpful. And I think uh, I myself very much appreciated it. And I think it really helped the final product uh, come out uh, much more native and more English. Because uh, the, the translator themselves, they, they, they have trouble sometimes detaching themselves from the source text enough to um, uh, enough to notice those influences of the source language. Yeah, yeah I think right, if, I may, if I may add something, it's really it's fa it's really fascinating to to see that the book is really a collective enterprise of uh, of uh, many people, and the author is only one of them, and um, and. My advice is really to, to, to take that into consideration. Of course, you want to bring your, your idea. Of course, you want to, uh, to, to bring your sources and so on. But also, uh, you have to be able to work with others, to hear the other, to change. Uh, and this, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this capacity to move from the position of the uh, of expressing yourself to the the position of collaborating in within a team uh, is very important and i think it can maybe have, be helpful for other that you have to 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 be to be not only an author uh, but also to be a uh, part of a team that uh, that is that is uh, that everybody knows uh, what is a book and uh, Sylvia knows, and Avi knows, and uh, of course uh, Eugene, and and uh, e everyone has the idea what should be done, and uh, not only the author, and this capacity to move from uh, property to uh, collaborative working is, is very important. Great, right. thank you, Avi. Um, appreciate your appreciate your insight. I, I want to move on to the next part of our discussion, um, which really has to do with the review process. So, Sylvia, I'll ask you: um, What does the review process look like uh, at Brandeis? Let's say from the time that uh, a proposal is submitted uh, and lands on your desk, um, and try to be you know try try to be as specific as possible. Um, considering I know that there's probably many different authors with many different, you know, uh, um, uh, needs. Um, but in terms of what are the steps in the process uh, from the time from the time of proposal uh, through the time that there's actually a hard, a hard copy that comes out. Um, thank you, Avi. There are um, many different paths. So um, we usually get a proposal, which includes an introduction to the book. Um, an annotated table of contents, um, perhaps a sample chapter, uh, the author's CV, uh, some discussion of when will the book be ready uh, for prime time, um, and who is the intended readership. Um, we can take that proposal and send it to our editors internally at Brandeis, um, and we might also seek outside reviewers to look at the proposal and give us and give the author some advice on whether their game plan is a good game plan and whether they should go ahead and proceed in this way. Um, for the most part, uh, the proposal is only the ante room to getting a final manuscript and sending the final manuscript out for peer review. Um, 
for uh, senior veteran scholars who've been published extensively, sometimes the proposal once approved will lead to an advanced contract saying um, you have an advanced contract and uh, when you submit the final manuscript that will go out for peer review. So publication is contingent upon getting positive uh, and constructive readers reports. Um, generally speaking, however, uh, junior scholars who don't have a track record of publication of books uh, will typically, will look at the proposal, will review it, will give them some uh, constructive advice and will say, yes, we'd like to see this manuscript when it's finished and uh, we will then give it serious consideration. We'll read it in house and we'll send it out for peer review. Great. And, and, and how would you define what makes up a strong proposal or what are some of the characteristics that make up strong proposal in your mind? And on the flip side, what are some of the characteristics or what are some of the flaws that you see most commonly, uh, whether it be junior scholars or, or even more senior scholars that you know, uh, scholars should avoid before they go ahead and, and send you an email or submit via the website? Right. So we're looking for uh, original questions. We're looking for uh, creativity and originality in um, the scholarly approach to the subject matter, to the question. Um, we're looking for um, both interesting questions and interesting ways of answering those questions, uh, which is another way of saying that a proposal uh, on any subject should make an argument in the first paragraph. Should say, okay, this book is, this book tells the story of, this book is about. Um, the one thing that is my pet peeve is when a proposal comes in and says, this book is going to fill a gap somewhere. And I, I don't mean to be snide about that, but usually I'm, you know, if there's a gap, maybe it should be there. If there's a hole, maybe it should be there. Uh, the fact that there's nothing there is not a reason to do something about it. So again, we're looking for creativity, we're looking for interesting questions, interesting approaches, scholarly approaches to answering that question. Um, we're looking for a book that, a proposal that understands who its audience is, uh, for a book that's deeply centered and rooted in its field or subject matter, that it's aware of its surroundings. Um, and we're looking for, and I'll make a segue now to the second part of your question, something that is well-written and something that speaks um, to more than three people. So I'll give you a very quick example of that. I often uh, consult with uh, junior scholars, young folks um, who are trying to turn a dissertation into a book. And um, some people don't understand really what that means. You know, like, okay, I can take out the lit review and I can take out the 20,000 pages of footnotes and then it's ready. And, and usually I say, well, how many people were on your dissertation committee? And, you know, the numbers vary three to five. And I said, okay, so your dissertation was written to please three to five people. And they were experts in your field and they spoke your language and you spoke their language. But now, as you said earlier, Avi, now that we're gonna to move to a book phase, we have to at least speak to a few hundred people. We have to make sure that not only the experts understand the subject matter, but a general educated reader can approach the material, can read it and that you can convey it in a um, interesting and, and uh, appealing way. And then to get to the next part of that, um, the proposal has to be well-written. Uh, it has to be in good English or it has to be in good Hebrew or it has to be in good something language, but um, 
proposals that are presented in English that are lame in terms of language um, are really going out into the world uh, with a handicap. Uh, and so elegant English, graceful English, English that appeals, that catches the editor's you know, throat when they read the first paragraph is what's very important. So I sometimes tell our, you know, our clients that I, the, way I, the way they should envision the proposal process or, or how they write um, what their book is really about, um, which you alluded to, that needs to jump out in the first paragraph, it's sort of the opposite, the exact opposite of a novel, right? A novel is supposed to draw you in, but you don't know the, you don't know the big scoop until the very end, right? And that's why you read through the entire book. Um, and I often tell academics that they need to think about, you know, a lot of academics write in a similar fashion. I tell them, no, you need to, you know, you're, if you have a big uh, uh, revelation or you have a, you know, you've done something really extraordinary, tell us from the outset. Because if you don't tell us from the outset, the reviewer might not get through, uh, you know, the, to get to the, to the very end where you really want to say what you want to say. So I'm curious if that's, you know, if you find that, you know, sometimes um, proposals don't necessarily uh, elucidate or elaborate on exactly the main, uh, you know, punchline of the text, you know, until too late or if at all. Right. Most of the least good proposals that come in are the ones that spend three paragraphs describing the research. The methodology, right. Uh, you know, I explored this area and here's how I explored it. And these are the resources and the sources that I looked at. And by page two and a half, we get to the question I asked of these sources and a hint at what was found. So what I'm suggesting is don't bury the lead. Bring the lead forward. Try to capture the reader's attention immediately um, and, and bring, that out, um, bring that out right away. And yeah. Thank you. That's that's really helpful advice. Um, Cedric, can you just, from your perspective, just take us through the process from the time that you know we we, we finished work together and you finished working on the on on the translation, um, and then you sent it to Sylvia. What was you know? I, I imagine it wasn't straight from there to the press. Um, there was probably some work in between. So can you just tell us? Describe for us what it was like working with, you know, uh, uh, the Brandeis team in general and, and maybe try and detail like the steps along the way uh, so that, you know, maybe other scholars who haven't published yet um, can or, or scholars who have published with other publishers can understand, you know, from an author's perspective, what that process looks like and how long it takes maybe. Yeah. So um, the, the process was really very fast and, uh, and excellent. Uh, but there were there was basically uh, three stages. So uh, first uh, there was a, a, a first um, uh, linguistic and uh, um, not only linguistic a, a review of, of, of the book with a, a lot of suggestions and transformation uh, asked by uh, especially editor uh, and then I had to go through the entire uh, manuscript and uh, accept or not uh, the, the, the proposition it was very helpful that was not only um, uh, questions but a lot of time suggestions so it really helps uh, to, to make the process uh, easier. Then, uh, when uh, the, I answered uh, all the question or proposal, the, I, I received um, a few months later um, a second uh, um, a second uh, manuscript. Second time the manuscript, this time already uh, paged and uh, on, on very, very close to baby printed. And there, there uh, also I, I went through, corrected uh, errors, uh, and uh, that's another uh, lot of work, of course. And um, we made an index 
uh, together a uh, bibliography uh, around that time. And the last, uh, but not uh, least, is of course uh, the wonderful um, cover of, uh, uh, of the book, by the way uh, uh, the, the, the whole book is uh, presented and uh, the thing that are written uh, on the jacket and uh, contacting scholars that read already a manuscript or part of the books uh, if they are ready to um, uh, write in a comment, on a favorable comment on, on the book. And uh, that are the, the basically the three stages that we went through until, uh, until the, the, the publishing, uh, the printing actually, uh, of the book. And of course, after uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, publicity, but this is not anymore part of your question. Avi, if I can just interject, yes. um, for many of our viewers, um, we've kind of skipped over one part of the process. What was different about Cedric's book is that it had already been um, peer reviewed um, when it appeared in Hebrew. And um, we, we saw those reviews and we uh, acknowledged them and accepted them and then moved to translation. And then of course the editors at Brandeis communicated with Cedric and talked about some other suggestions and ideas specifically related to the English. The part we skipped over in this instance um, was typically we'll get a manuscript um, which has yet to be peer reviewed. Um, and we may or may not see it first in English. We have the capacity at Brandeis to review Hebrew manuscripts. Um, we prefer the English, but we, do, we can review Hebrew manuscripts. Um, so whether it comes in in Hebrew, whether it comes in in English, uh, we send the, the book out for peer review and we receive uh, peer reviews in re back. We share those with the author. Uh, these are an opportunity for the author to respond, to accept suggestions of the peer reviewers, to um, contest some of those. But typically the peer review process, just about everybody, everywhere rather, and, and at Brandeis for sure, uh, is an opportunity to make it the best manuscript possible, to turn it into the best book possible. Um, so that's just one step here that was unusual uh, in that um, this was, quote, a straight translation, and we skipped over the uh, broader peer review process. Yeah, I, I find it quite incredible that that, you know, even if you didn't maybe necessarily have a formal peer review process, there was always you know, constructive feedback. And, you know, if you think about the number of, you know, even after the book was published in Hebrew, after peer review, right? So certain things were elucidated in translation and later on, you know, more things are elucidated by some of the Brandeis editors. It's incredible how, you know, I always, always tell our clients that any intelligent reader should be able to add something to a text, right? And the fact that an intelligent reader does add something doesn't necessarily reflect, you know, on the previous, you know, previous stage. It just means that there's always, further depth or further clarification that can be made, you know, on, on a specific text. And in a certain way, you know, perfection can be the enemy of success in that, in that regard, right? At a certain point, you have to say, okay, we've done the vast, you know, we've done what we can do. And it's important that it gets out in, in good time and that we, you know, give the attention to the other projects as well. Um, so we, we sometimes joke around uh, in our office that I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive over to the author's home and I'm going to steal their computer. <laughs> because enough already with the, you know, with the revising, it's time to, you know, get this show on the road uh, because it's a forever thing. But that's also another way what you alluded to, Avi, is the fact that whether it starts out in Hebrew or it starts out in English or it starts out in another language or it starts out in English and becomes an English publication or a Hebrew or Hebrew publication, a book is a living thing. It, it lives, it breathes, it expands, it contracts, um, and different people 
uh, bring um, different um, suggestions, comments, ideas, um, perspectives to that living thing. And so it's not just the editors who work with the author and bring that book forward and bring it into the world. But then we have the wonderful experience, all of us, of working with extraordinary copy editors and style editors and designers who then take this two-dimensional thing and turn it into something three-dimensional. And they give it a face and they give it a picture and they enliven it um, and they give it a new, a new life. So if you look at it in that sense, then the entire process is sort of bringing something, you know, being, we're all kind of midwives in this, in this process. All right, so to, to expand upon your analogy then, um, if after, if after the, the baby is born, uh, you know, you then need to make a big party to uh, celebrate it, or at least after COVID is finished, um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you get the word out? Um, what I mean by that is, uh, I, and this, uh, this question really is for both of you, and I, I assume you have slightly different answers, but the fact, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, the, the, the books that are, you know, thoroughly researched and, and someone's poured five, 10 years of their, of their life uh, sweating away on a, uh, and then it gets bought by three libraries and sits on a shelf and collects dust. So how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Um, I guess that, that probably starts already in the writing stage, but, you know, let's, let's talk about, you know, after the book is published, how do you make sure that it gets out to the audiences that, that you know, would be interested or, or, or should be hearing about it? Um, so I'll start perhaps and then let Cedric uh, continue. Um, it starts from the littlest things and it to the biggest things. Um, the author um, is the single most important factor in uh, the word of the book getting out into the world. So take Cedric, for example, he has been relentless since the book appeared. He has been um, in this year of COVID and pandemic um, is a regular on Zoom. And he has been speaking at conferences and he has generated uh, symposia about his book. And he's worked on launches uh, in different audiences, whether it's the Renaissance Society or some other organization. So it's the author um, who, really has the lion's share of responsibility in the sense that it's their baby if we wanna continue that metaphor and, um, and everything that they can do to get the word out to all of their audiences. And it starts with the simplest things. So some people think, oh my God, I don't know how to create a blog about my book or create a website for my book. But the truth of the matter is that if you think about how many emails you write a day, some of us dozens, others hundreds. If all you do for starters is put a signature at the bottom of your email, alerting the recipient of all of your emails that you just published a book and you send that reader of your email to the book's website or where to purchase it, those are things that don't cost anything at all, but they're one of the ways to get, get the word out. Um, and then of course, for example, at the Tauber Institute, we invest heavily in getting the word out about the book. Um, we um, work on soliciting reviews. Uh, we work on um, expanding uh, information about the book. Uh, we organize launches um, all the way to Brandeis University Press uh, getting the word out in many, many different ways through um, social media, through website, through uh, endorsements, um, and through or helping, to or helping the author organize special events. And then, of course, uh, Brandeis University Press, which is an independent uh, freestanding press, uh, is working with um, Chicago University Press as our distributor. And uh, Chicago also does marketing and just not only distribution, but also marketing and publicity for our books. So we have that third, that third arm 
Um, but it's about everyone along the way uh, doing whatever they can to get the word out. That's great. So Cedric, is that is that true? You've been uh, working like a madman this last year? <laughs> Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. <laughs> yeah. I hope I, I could travel around the, the U.S. Uh, after the book was finished, but I, 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 I ended up uh, in my room uh, making a lot of Zooms. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun, but it was not exactly the kind of fun that I imagined uh, at, at the beginning. But yes, by a, uh, what I did was first, of course, to uh, try to interest uh, my colleagues and my friends. Uh, I am basically addressing in the academic world two audiences or maybe three audiences. One is uh, uh, Jewish studies, um, uh, which the Brandeis uh, 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 University Press is maybe more in contact with and uh, was very helpful uh, for me uh, to be in contact with them. Uh, and the other audience uh, is not specifically uh, Jewish. Uh, it, uh, it is uh, Renaissance uh, scholars, early modern scholars. Uh, and uh, I, I really uh, try to be active in these two uh, uh, scholars' communities, uh, trying to explain uh, and again, uh, in different contexts, what, what, what is interesting in uh, Abravanel, what is interesting in the book, um, and also uh, part, of, uh, part of it is uh, trying to uh, get the people read the book, especially uh, leading scholars. Uh, so uh, Brenda's University Press was very helpful to, to, to send it two leading scholars, um, and uh, I also uh, sometimes send it uh, myself. And uh, you want to really that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 20, 30 important people in the first two years uh, uh, get, get an opinion about the book, and, uh, and that, that is very, very helpful. Of course, you have to be also active on the, in the, for the libraries uh, and the institution that uh, should buy the book or at least uh, uh, internet access to, to the book, if not nowadays, the, maybe the, 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 the format uh, is, is changing. And, uh, and yes, and, and, and trying to mention to different audience not only uh, people interested in the medieval, I, I did something uh, about medieval period, I did something in the Renaissance, but I can do uh, something about uh, contemporary Israel. Why, why is Abravanel not present uh, in, a, uh, in uh, contemporary Israel? Why uh, the Sephardic, Sephardis in Israel never speak about Abravanel? Very intriguing. Uh, they pick uh, everybody. Uh, Abraham Tzafati, you know, but uh, Abravana is never there. Uh, why? Uh, they are ashamed of him or what, what's the problem? Um, so you try to adapt yourself uh, to different contexts. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I, I had an interview uh, with a um, um, uh, Haredi uh, man, uh, 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 made a postcard for him. So you, you have to interact with the very, very different communities uh, and uh, to be able to answer uh, different questions, to adapt yourself. Uh, I got quite a lot of emails from uh, readers uh, and then they ask you uh, uh, more about Abravanel, so you have to be responsive to them. Um, <laughs> and I get uh, almost all the time, maybe this time not, uh, members from the uh, Abravanel clan all over the world who uh, <laughs> ask me about the special uh, uh, family uh, uh, and the story of uh, 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 the, the Abravanel family uh, from uh, Israel to Brazil to where, wherever you, you want. So you have 
this is uh, uh, Sylvia spoke. The, the book is leaving. You know, after uh, you you this, you you make the book in a special environment, but then it goes uh, in very different places. You know, and uh, you have to you you have to enjoy it and to be. Uh, to be open to very different readers who are interested in very different things. Right. Uh, and that's it. Cedric, I assume that you're familiar with the joke about why about Abravanel turned, turned all the religious people into heretics, right? No. No? Okay. All right. Well, then I'll share it with everyone. Um, this is what I was, when, many years ago, I was told that if you're familiar with the Bravanel's writing, um, he, he oftentimes his writing on the Bible is contained very long essays with many questions. And it and you know, we could have 20, 30, 40 questions until he gets to a long essay which tries to elucidate and answer all of his questions in one in one essay. Um, but what happened was is that too many people, you know, got to the questions and then they fell asleep on a Friday night, so they didn't get a chance to read the answers, <laughs> so then they became heretics because there were too many good questions. So anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> good, good thing. I, I enjoyed that one. Um, okay, brilliant. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Sylvia, I want to ask you a few quick hitting questions, just very practical. Uh, no more than one minute answers because we're running out of time. Uh, because I know that, you know, uh, some of the members of the audience um, want to know some very practical uh, information. So first of all, are there specific fields of interest that Brandeis or Tauber takes a particular interest in? Uh, that will give, you know, members of the audience an understanding of whether their su uh, subject to area of research is of interest at all to, to Tauber and to Brandeis. So uh, Brandeis University Press uh, publishes in the humanities and social sciences and um, <laughs> natural sciences, um, especially uh, environmental work. Um, and one of our areas of specialization and always has been is Jewish studies. Now at Brandeis, we have six, I think if I'm counting correctly, but please look at our website, um, various uh, series in Jewish studies. Uh, the Brandeis series in American Jewish history, culture and life. Uh, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute series on Jewish women. Um, the uh, Schusterman series in Israel studies. Um, and, and, um, and we've just started a new series. We're launching the first book in this first two books in the spring, the Mendel series and studies uh, in Jewish education. Um, so we look at Jewish studies very, very broadly and are interested in a very broad range of areas. Um, there are virtually no areas that we don't do any publishing at all in. Um, in the area of Jewish studies. So um, that's something that we're interested in, you know, across the board uh, and whether the book is suitable for a particular series or it's out of series. We're not looking to cram anything into any particular area. The Tauber series in which Avi's book appears um, focuses primarily on the modern Jewish experience, modern stretched, um, in uh, to uh, started out with a primary focus on European Jewry, uh, but we're broadening that perspective as well. Uh, so we're not letting the, the definition of a series get in the way of the best book. Um, we're looking for good original scholarship. Okay. And, and we're also looking, yes. quickly I know, we're also looking for books for course adoption, particularly in the American, um, in the American, uh, sorry about that, in, in, uh, for American um, colleges and universities. Got it. Um, and just quick follow up, the elephant in the room, what are, what are the costs and does Brandeis ask for a subvention in the publication process? How does that work? Brandeis does not ask for a subvention for publication. Uh, books are expensive. Um, and uh, we have the good fortune at Brandeis of having a number of centers and institutes uh, who are deeply committed to the mission of uh, Jewish studies more broadly. Um, and so we often provide uh, support for books so that they can appear at a, at a, um, at a cost that is affordable for students. Um, I will say, however, that 
you know, if you've got a book with 300 illustrations or you want to have a color insert or um, you want very fancy maps designed or so on, um, it's always good to go to your own institution and see if you can get some additional support so that you can get that value added. You can, you know, add those things to your book. Okay. And, um, and if, if people are interested in submitting uh, to, to Brandis, submitting a proposal or submitting a full manuscript, what's the best way to go about doing so? Uh, is it emailing you? Is it, is it reaching out to the series editor? Is, it, is there a form online? What's the practical way to do it? There is uh, um, at uh, lab, uh, the, I think I sent you the link, Avi, if you want to put it up. Yes, I put it up, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, we have a description of what a proposal should look like. Um, you can email me directly. Uh, you can email the press directly. Uh, you can be in touch with series editors at the get-go. Um, we're not a huge institution and we're not siloed. So we all talk to one another um, and we all communicate. And so series editors will make proposals to us. We'll, offer uh, things that we get to series editors, it'll be a conversation. So any which way that you come at it is fine. Okay, great, fantastic. So I've, yeah, I've left and I've dropped in the chat uh, the resources for, for authors as well. Right, and that's where the, the proposal guidelines are. Great, fantastic. So you, hopefully um, anyone who's interested can follow that link. Uh, there's also a list of publications in case you're interested in you know, browsing around the Brown Dice Library. Um, you know, for Cedric's book and beyond. Um, and I also uh, left a link uh, for our services. Uh, that's academic language experts. If anyone uh, needs help with translating or editing uh, their materials, um, where we really would be happy to, uh, to have a conversation with you and, and, and talk about, you know, what that process looks like and how it, how it unfolds. Um, I will put up just quickly, um, one second here. Here is a uh, slide. You've got, uh, oh, you know what, Sylvia? I forgot to put your email on here. So do you want to tell everyone your email in, in case uh, people want to be in touch? F-U-K-S-F-R-I-E-D, all one word, at Brandeis, B-R-A-N-D-E-I-S dot E-D-U. Great, fantastic. Maybe drop that in the chat as well in case there, okay. um, in case anyone wants to just copy and paste. Um, you know, obviously, uh, anyone who wants to be in touch with me um, is welcome to do so. My wife tells me that I'm too available. Um, so, you know, that works to your advantage. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that pretty much uh, wraps up uh, the session. First of all, uh, a big uh, call to uh, to everyone who, uh, who, 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 you know, stuck it out and was here from start to finish. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I know that it's, it's not easy, especially, you know, given the timing. Um, you know, to have made that commitment. So we appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, you know, again, encourage you to, you know, to consider purchasing um, Cedric's book and take a look online and, and, and have a look. And, you know, if you have any follow-up questions to be in touch with Sylvia or be in touch with myself. So thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Avi. Thank you uh, to Jonathan. Um, really great, uh, you know, uh, meeting everyone uh, today, this evening, uh, this morning. And, uh, and I hope that uh, we'll see you again at, at future events. Thank you, thank Avi. Thank you so much. Thank Susan, you so much. thank you. And Aviva, thank you. Thank you, Avi. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sylvia. It's with great pleasure to see you and to discuss with Likewise. you. Likewise. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.